Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Andrea Glorioso, Policy Officer of the European Commission and responsible for the Future of Work dossier at DG Connect. Welcome, Andrea. Welcome, thank you. Work is a topic of great social and economic importance, one that is being tackled in many ways within the European Commission. What is the role of the department that you work at? So the department, the part of the European Commission uh, where I work and I've been working for the past years uh, uh, is DG Connect, which stands for Communication Networks, Content and Technology. And it's the ministry, if you will, of the European Commission that deals specifically with digitalization under all different perspectives. And uh, within DG Connect, uh, my angle on the future of work discussions is, unsurprisingly, the impact of digital technologies and digitalization uh, on labor markets, uh, the way they're working, uh, jobs being created, jobs being destroyed, uh, jobs changing, uh, and all these kind of things. And before we get into the thick of the discussions, uh, let me remind you and all our listeners uh, that here I'm expressing only my personal opinions and nothing of what I'm going to say here necessarily reflects the position of the European Commission. Of course. Thank you for clarifying that. So the future of work and in particular the impact that digitality has on work Sometimes this topic may be perceived as distant or rhetorical or even worse, something that's just about boosting the economy. But how the European Commission goes about this topic is in a very human-centric way. That is, there is the awareness that the future of work is, in fact, the future of the men and women who are workers, who are citizens, and who are being impacted by this digital revolution that we've been going through for a while. So in the media, oftentimes we see the negative aspects highlighted, jobs that disappear or the volatility of the job market. But you mentioned some opportunities also. So shall we start on a positive note and look at the bright side of this transition? Yes, absolutely. And, and for the record, we like certainly in this part of the commission uh, to look uh, not naively, but realistically at the positive angle of digitalization. Uh, and in terms of job creation, uh, uh, you know, we hear a lot of numbers here and there. I think it's, it's very difficult uh, sometimes uh, to identify what new jobs that do not exist today are going to be created, uh, much like uh, when the car was first introduced. Uh, uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, horse riders were pretty unhappy about it, uh, but at the time nobody could actually predict or understand uh, all the ways in which the car sector would develop and all the jobs that it would create. So it's not that I don't want to give an answer, but I think one has to be very humble uh, and recognize that historically technological change, uh, if we look at the history of the past 200 years more or less, uh, technological change uh, always tended to create, uh, if not slightly more jobs uh, than it destroyed, uh, to reach a balance between jobs created uh, and destroyed. Uh, now, the thing to keep in mind, having said all of that, uh, is the pace of change. Technological change uh, uh, already in the first and the second industrial revolution, as I said, is nothing new. But the pace of change that we saw uh, in the first and second industrial revolution was much slower than what we are seeing today. And so I think there is, uh, we think there is a, a fair question, a fair issue to be addressed, which is how to cope with this change, uh, make sure that we can use as a society all the opportunities, uh, but also make sure that those who cannot realistically adapt as quickly as the pace of these changes would require are not just left behind. Uh, that is not the way we do th things in Europe. We like to think about the European social model. Uh, we believe in free markets and open markets, but we also believe that people should not be just left out in the cold uh, because they're not, uh, quote unquote, uh, useful <laughs> anymore to the economy. Can you give an example of what it means to be left behind? I assume it's not just about losing your job because a machine, a robot, replaced you. There are more subtle ways of being left behind, probably not keeping up with the level of digital literacy that is required. 
Uh, indeed, as, as you point out, uh, or as it just, I think you're hinting at, uh, the big fear that we have seen uh, on, on newspapers, on the media, in the common debate uh, is about uh, automation, is about the uh, strict replacement uh, of uh, human labor, of human beings uh, working, whichever work they do, by machines. Um, personally, I, I think that these fears are a little bit exaggerated uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, that uh, accepting very repetitive uh, tasks uh, for very repetitive tasks, uh, which, by the way, many human beings uh, would probably be very happy not have to do, uh, these repetitive tasks can be automated and are already being automated. But as soon as you get into slightly more complex uh, jobs uh, which require human interaction, uh, which require uh, empathic skills and social skills, uh, which require decision in the face of uh, uh, deep uncertainty, well, then you start to see that uh, it's not that easy to actually replace uh, human beings. Uh, and even if you could replace human beings, uh, you immediately start having to deal with questions, uh, uh, legal questions, such as uh, liability, who's responsible if something goes wrong. We have uh, a quite uh, well-developed uh, body of laws uh, to decide uh, in human labor who is responsible if something goes wrong in complex production processes. Once you put a robot, to be simple, in that equation, uh, the robot doesn't do what it's supposed to do or does it wrong and somebody gets hurt uh, and so on and so forth, who is responsible for that? It's not that this questions uh, cannot have an answer. We are actually the commission, as many other places, we're thinking about all of this. All I'm suggesting here is that fears of uh, uh, outright uh, massive uh, replacement of human labor by machines uh, are probably exaggerated. And even the academic research, uh, which, you know, when, when the first uh, papers started to appear on the topic of a uh, human-robot replacement, uh, the numbers that you could see were very scary. 60% of jobs being replaced. And then as academic research became better and researchers started to go a little bit more in depth into the numbers and ask better questions, uh, it turns out, again, I'm, I'm not going to give hard numbers and I don't think that anybody is able to give hard numbers, uh, but the reasoning now is more about probably around 8-9% of jobs uh, being potentially completely replaceable by machines, which does not mean that they will be replaced by machines because there are economic considerations uh, at stake there as well. However, and this is something where there is consensus and we should all be aware of this, the tasks within jobs, the nature of jobs uh, will uh, deeply change. Uh, and again, this is not any different than what we have seen uh, throughout human history. If you think about what, to make a silly example, what a secretary used to do 40 years ago before personal computers became widespread, and you compare that with what a secretary does today with the support of personal computers, the tasks have changed quite a bit, and that requires adaptation, not only of the worker, him or herself, but of the whole organizational structure, in some cases, of society as a whole. In addition to automation, uh, there are other I wouldn't say fears, but, you know, things we have to think about. Uh, personally, I think that one very important element uh, which deserves uh, in-depth attention uh, is the way in which digitalization uh, is not the trigger, is not the cause, but is certainly a tool, and in some cases you might say the contribution uh, to an increasing uh, flexibilization of work relations. Now, that flexibilization, which in practice means that it's much more uncommon nowadays uh, to have a lifelong uh, job with one single employer, that's kind of one quote-unquote extreme, if you will, uh, it doesn't mean that we're all going to become uh, delivery riders and uh, not knowing where our next uh, gig is going to come uh, the next week, uh, which is the other extreme and personally, I think not a very good way to organize our labor markets. But statistically, we can see that already since a few years, uh, the average length of work relations uh, has gone down. People change jobs uh, more quickly. Now, there are different reasons for that, but it's hard to deny that digitalization and the flexibility in work relations that digitalization allows uh, has been a contributor to that. Now, Flexibilization or flexibility in labor relations is not per se a bad thing because uh, there can be many reasons why somebody might want, actually a worker might want to have a more flexible work relation. For example, because that person uh, uh, could not, uh, has to take care of a child. 
And for the record, that can be a man or a woman. It should not necessarily only be women, although in practice nowadays we see that more often with women. A person has to take care of a child, cannot really afford to have a full-time job. On the other hand, that person does not want not to do anything, so having a flexible work relation can be useful in that case. Having said that, extreme flexibilization also can introduce the elements of uh, uncertainty, both in the labor relation and uh, I think most importantly in the life of people. Because if you don't know precisely where you're going to be in one, two or three years uh, time, as much as human beings can know that, life can be very unpredictable. But if you don't know where you're going to be professionally in one, two, three years, then probably you're not going to make certain long-term expenses. Uh, uh, for example, a loan or thinking about buying a car or a house that has implications for the economy as a whole, uh, I would also argue that that has psychological implications. Uh, so again, as it might be clear, I, I don't think that anybody has a, a clear set of answers to all these questions, uh, but those are questions that are important to uh, raise and they have been raised and to debate factually and there I think that here and there you can still see that the debate is a little bit too much dominated by ideology uh, rather than by more concrete facts and numbers. Would you mind explaining what you mean by ideology here? That's a very complicated question, but I will try to go a little bit more in depth. Uh, um, one of the reasons why I, for the past uh, slightly more than a year, I've been working on this specific topic, uh, which is slightly uncommon in the part of the commission uh, where I'm working, uh, is because I am deeply convinced that how we see work, how we see the way in which we want as a society to configure labor relations uh, is both an economic question, uh, but it's also a political question. And if you look at history, massive changes uh, in uh, labor relations, uh, the massive changes in the nature of work, which rights workers had, uh, or massive transformations in the economy, for example, from agricultural to, uh, to industrial societies, uh, have always been, uh, if not the cause, uh, certainly a very important element of massive political changes. I mean, if you look at the first and second industrial revolution, uh, the economic and structural changes uh, of those times were one of the elements uh, that uh, led to the growth of the international communist movement in Europe and in the rest of the world. And this I say it without any, uh, I mean, I have my own personal judgment on, uh, on uh, communism, but I'm not mentioning that for that reason, simply to point out that this is not only about the economics. So as soon as you put the politics, the idea of society that we have, uh, that's what I mean by ideology. And there is nothing wrong with that because these discussions, again, they are not and they should not only be technical discussions. It's not only about the numbers. It's not only about the macroeconomic uh, uh, future of our continent, although all of these things are important. Uh, what sometimes uh, I feel uh, is that uh, rather than looking at the numbers uh, and then trying to understand uh, the numbers in terms of uh, you know future jobs, the dynamics uh, of the economic system, rather than saying, uh, okay, I, Andra Glorioso, uh, I have this particular political idea of how the society in which I live in should look like. And everybody has those ideas, and that's why we have politics and different ways to try to find uh, um, balance between all of these ideas. Uh, so rather than saying, these are the numbers, uh, this is the idea of society that I have in mind, uh, let me see how I can steer the change that we're going through based on the numbers in order to achieve uh, that political idea of a society that I have. This, in my view, should be uh, what we should be doing, and to a large extent we are doing. Sometimes the discussions uh, are more about uh, this is the political idea of society that I want, uh, whether on the left, on the right, etc. I kind of ignore the numbers uh, and expect the numbers to adapt to that political reality. I don't think we should, in discussions about technology as anything else, uh, we should not necessarily take uh, the numbers as a given uh, because, you know, numbers are the way you collect numbers, you interpret numbers is always open. Uh, but at some point, you also have to face the realities on the ground, whether that's about, uh, you know, which kind of technologies in Europe we are strong in, uh, which kind of uh, products and services are requested internally and externally, which has an impact uh, on which industries and companies are going to grow in Europe or not, which in return, or as a consequence, has an impact on how our labor market are probably going to look like.
considering our current situation, what can we observe in the landscape of work? Is there some issue that stands out more than others? For example, the need for digital skills or the volatility of the job market? So how does it look like right now? How are we doing? It's difficult uh, to identify uh, any particular issue as the most important one because we live in complex societies. Uh, the dynamics that we're looking at, n not only the future of work, labor dynamics, this is true in almost every facet of life, but they are complex dynamics. Uh, I think we can identify a few elements uh, on which we really need to pay attention. One, uh, as you were mentioning, is certainly the issue of uh, skills or competencies or literacy, whichever way you want to define that, uh, and understand there are subtle differences between all of those. But the reality, and again, I, I return to the point on the numbers that I made, uh, the reality is that independently of whether we are going to become a fully digital society, whatever that means, or we're going to remain strongly attached to our traditional sectors uh, in Europe, which you know vary from member state to member state. But the reality is that there is basically no job uh, in the next five to ten years. There will not be any job which does not require at least some basic level of digital skills. And by basic level, I literally mean being able to turn on a computer, send an email, uh, maybe in some cases uh, know what an Excel sheet is and how to process that. And uh, we have been seeing as digitalization, as all sectors of life and the economy have become uh, uh, digitized, uh, this need to have at least these basic digital skills uh, has become uh, even more predominant. The problem is that, uh, or one of the problems is that if you look uh, at the realities in Europe, uh, we still have uh, a very large segment of our population, especially older people, but not only, by the way, which do not even have those basic digital skills. On top of that, and again, this is true across sectors, uh, we can see that uh, we see that there are uh, there is a growth uh, of um, let's call them more advanced uh, digital technologies, uh, whether that's uh, uh, what nowadays is known as artificial intelligence uh, or uh, big data and data analytics and data processing, and all these technologies and others uh, are, uh, as I said, quite horizontally permeating all different uh, sectors, and they can be incredibly useful for increasing productivity, for coming up with new business ideas, for selling your products. Uh, and by the way, I'm kind of thinking now more about the private sector, but very similar considerations could be made about the public sector where advanced digital technologies can deliver more effective and efficient public services. Uh, which in times in which some countries uh, have budgetary <laughs> issues, uh, you know, it's not a bad idea. And uh, if As I said, uh, our population has uh, some troubles. Not, it's not the only one, by the way. This is quite widespread around the world. But looking at Europe, where what is striking is that on average, uh, the uh, European citizens are quite uh, well educated. On average, much better than in most other parts of the world. And yet, when it comes to digital skills, uh, both basic and certainly advanced digital skills, uh, we are having issues. Um, So in addition to this particular uh, perspective on digital skills, uh, I think we need to consider the way in which the introduction of digital technologies uh, or the widespread use of digital technologies, uh, and in particular what nowadays uh, people have started to call platform work uh, or the use of online labor platforms, which from my perspective is nothing particularly new. The existence of intermediaries uh, uh, between uh, uh, the labor demand and offer has been with us for a very long time. What is more interesting uh, is that the introduction of these online labor platforms, which for the time being are still a very minor part of the overall labor force, but have been growing uh, very fast in the past uh, three to four years. So it's still an open question whether this growth uh, is going to continue. Right now are very optimistically, uh, depending on how you count, uh, we are talking about uh, between four and six percent of the entire European labor force using this online labor platform. And this is a very, very generous assessment. Uh, Uh, but as I said, this has been growing very fast. Uh, and so the question is, is it going to grow even faster? And the issue there is online labor platforms can serve a very useful purpose uh, because they do introduce uh, sometimes flexibility. And uh, some people uh, like or need flexibility. So in that way, online labor platforms uh, 
can allow people who were until this moment uh, excluded from the labor market to enter into the labor market. Certainly, online labor platforms are not usually the kind of uh, uh, environments which guarantee a very long-term career. And there is an open question to what extent online labor platforms uh, provide for uh, uh, what is commonly found in more traditional uh, employer-employee relationships, uh, which is uh, on-the-job training, uh, social uh, uh, contribution to social protection, etc. And all of these are questions that we are exploring. Uh, uh, to me, the most, if you will, uh, sociologically interesting question uh, is to what extent the flexibilization uh, and the atomization of labor relations, uh, which are maybe not in, were not introduced by labor platforms, but online labor platforms uh, do tend uh, in many cases to, to augment, uh, to, to what extent the atomization of these labor relations, uh, which effect this atomization has uh, on uh, the ability of workers to understand that, that they are not alone, that they are part of a larger group. Uh, now, labor unions uh, have uh, played a very important role uh, in the development of democracies uh, all across Europe uh, and not only. So I'm, I'm, I, I want to say that I fully respect their history and their role. Uh, they have also, and they will be the first to recognize that uh, they have also been a bit uh, slow in catching up uh, with uh, changes introduced by the digitalization. At least in some countries, uh, some labor unions uh, made uh, a very clear choice. Uh, so they chose to care more and to defend more for the traditional workers uh, rather than the uh, new economy workers as they used to be known uh, many decades ago. No, well, not many, a couple of decades ago when I entered into the labor market. Now, the question is, though, that what we have today or what we are seeing in some instances, uh, in particular with online labor platforms, uh, is a very atomized workforce, uh, which is very weak in terms of negotiation uh, with uh, uh, both the platform itself uh, and the uh, labor offer. Let's put it labor demand, sorry. So uh, the, the people who are offering uh, services uh, which the worker then uh, takes up. And I'm being very abstract because there are many different types of online labor platforms and people always think about Deliveroo and Uber, but you can have labor platforms uh, with very high skilled professionals offering their services for designers, uh, for uh, uh, musicians uh, and so on and so forth. These are not quote unquote low skilled jobs. Uh, to become a professional musician or a designer, you need to study quite a lot. Uh, you have uh, more localized online labor platforms. Uh, for example, uh, Uber is a typical example. Uber as a company is global, but the Uber, that the particular instance of Uber that you're going to use uh, connects you with drivers in your neighborhood uh, because you are, if you are in Brussels, you're not going to order a taxi in Stockholm. You want the taxi in Brussels. And likewise for other online labor platforms, uh, for example, for cleaning services and the like. So there are many different kinds of labor platforms and one has to be very careful to put them all together in one big box. But there is an underlying question, which is the broader question of the role of organized labor and uh, uh, collective negotiations. Uh, if you ask certain people, it's great that we don't have or we have less collective negotiations because this allows the uh, employer or the people who want labor to basically negotiate on a one-to-one -one basis with the worker. I think it's fair to say that in many cases, this puts the worker at a disadvantage. And again, if you look historically at the development of labor, uh, the absence uh, of organized uh, labor unions uh, usually in the end uh, leads uh, to labor unrest leads to, uh, to labor unrest, which is very often more difficult to manage uh, for the employer or for the business side because they don't have any more one or two or three single points of reference, uh, the labor unions with which to negotiate. So now I don't want to turn this, this is supposed to be about digitalization, but I do believe that digitalization is an element, not the only one uh, and arguably not the main cause, but is an element uh, in the progressive uh, atomization of labor relations that we have seen in the past 20 years or so, the good news is that it can also be a solution. Because to the extent that, uh, yes, if I am a graphic designer and I'm using online labor platforms, uh, I most probably don't go to the office where I can see other graphic designers. Uh, I can talk to the other graphic designers. Uh, if I don't like something about the workplace uh, or about the labor relation that we all have, I can organize with the other graphic designers. This is all very difficult when your interface to the, that particular labor market is a computer screen. 
But at the same time, digital technologies can also allow to disintermediate. You don't need necessarily to be physically with other people in order to talk and organize with other people. And so that there is an open question, which I don't have an answer to. And by the way, I, I know that uh, labor unions at the European level are thinking very carefully about that. Uh, how can the labor movement, uh, either through the traditional labor unions or through other ways, uh, help workers uh, to get organized. And, and again, this is not about workers uh, getting organized for the, I don't know, for, for the revolution uh, or for the dictatorship of the proletariat. You know, some people choose to believe that that is the goal. It's not me. But again, the point is that it's in nobody's interest in the mid to long term uh, to have a very atomized uh, workforce uh, to kind of uh, push that workforce to the limits uh, and do not give space uh, for collective negotiations, which in many cases will be hard negotiations, but the results of which uh, can be on the mid to long term more sustainable. And so once again, the question is how can uh, uh, digital technologies help in that kind of uh, new forms of negotiations, if you will, uh, new forms of uh, collective agreements, collective bargaining, uh, and so on and so forth. I would like to mention for our audience that you and I met for the first time last year in April 2018 at the second EU-US Young Leaders Seminar in Brussels, an event co-organized by the Fulbright, Erasmus Plus and Maris Klodowska Curie programs. I was invited as a young leader. It was very flattering. And of course, you were an expert speaker there. And the topic for the discussion of the two days was indeed the future of work. And to start the conversation, we were given the provoking question, will robots steal our jobs? That is an intriguing, controversial question that can start an interesting debate. But sadly, oftentimes in the media, we see that these types of discussions just remain on the surface. So first of all, because this is the field that you work in every day now, if this is a type of question that is often asked, if questions on artificial intelligence and robots are often heard, and if you will, try to give an answer to this provoking and controversial question, will robots steal our jobs? Um, it is certainly politically a big theme, and by that I mean that, yes, the question is asked uh, very often. Uh, I think that if I look at the most recent developments uh, of these debates, uh, that was kind of the question uh, two, three years ago. Nowadays it's still coming back, but in a more nuanced way and accompanied by other questions which I personally think are more relevant, uh, in some cases even more intelligent, uh, that are not per se about whether robots will steal jobs uh, or not. Uh, but on the particular issue of uh, whether robots will steal jobs or not, I think we have to be realistic and the technology that we have today, we can see or we can foresee for the next, I would say, five years, more or less. Uh, I think the notion uh, that robots or automation, automatic processes, will replace anything uh, but the most uh, repetitive uh, and frankly stupid tasks uh, is, is exaggerated. And anybody who has actually been working, uh, uh, you know, with his or her hands and brains uh, operation on these issues, uh, or anybody that I'm talking to who has been working very directly on the factory floor on these issues uh, would agree with me. In fact, there starts to be quite some interesting uh, qualitative research uh, on what actually happens once you introduce uh, uh, robots on the factory floor. And it turns out uh, there is some research coming from Germany. I understand that some more is being explored in France. Uh, this, is of course, you know, it's time consuming research because you need to have a trained researcher going to the factories uh, and observe uh, over a moderately long period of time what's actually happening rather than looking at the synthetic macroeconomic numbers, productivity levels, etc. Well, the qualitative research that we have uh, suggests that at least in some cases, uh, when a robot or an automated machine is introduced on the factory floors, uh, human beings are not replaced. Uh, human beings uh, have to complement 
the machine. There is so much in any uh, sufficiently complex production process uh, of a good or of a service uh, that human intervention is always needed. So again, the, the whole notion that uh, robots will kill all jobs or will replace jobs, uh, at the very least one has to nuance it very much. Which jobs are we talking about? Uh, are those jobs going to disappear <laughs> anyway, independent of whether you automate those processes or not? On top of that, I would also add that uh, the fact that a job can, uh, or, or certain tasks within a job can theoretically be automated uh, does not necessarily imply that it will be automated. Looking at the private sector more specifically now, any company has to make uh, certain choices when it introduces changes in their production uh, processes. How much will it cost me? Yes, this particular change, uh, in this case, the introduction of robots on the factory floor, to continue with the example, might possibly allow me to increase productivity by X percent. Uh, but introducing robots and forgetting even for a moment about the uh, labor uh, displacement effect, as it's called uh, in the literature, but this robot will cost me money. You know, robots, they don't come for free. It will cost me money to buy it. It will cost me money to operate it. It will cost me money if something is broken to fix it. Uh, so, you know, every company makes that kind of choice. And so once again... A lot of the numbers that we have seen in terms of uh, job displacement or job replacement by machines were based on what theoretically can happen and not necessarily what will happen in practice uh, once a company has to make uh, that choice. At the same time, uh, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that even though technological change is nothing new, digitalization is not an incredibly new phenomenon. We've been having, I mean, people disagree on when we should actually start counting uh, to talk about digitalization, but it's not something that appeared six months ago. And likewise, let's be very honest, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, which is the other thing that nowadays uh, is always on the front page uh, of newspapers, uh, is not new. The first research on artificial intelligence is from the 1950s, even before, depending on how you want uh, to define the term. What has changed, and this is something that's changed in the field of artificial intelligence, in the field of automation, and in digitalization more generally, and this is something we have to keep in mind, uh, is that there has been an exponential increase uh, in uh, processing power, how quickly can computers uh, make the calculations that they do, an exponential decrease uh, in the cost of storage, uh, because processing data, for whatever reason, uh, needs also storage space. Uh, point being is that it has become uh, much cheaper than it used to be, and this uh, uh, decreasing cost uh, has been uh, um, maybe not entirely exponential, but certainly very fast uh, for the past uh, 10, 15 years. At which point uh, does a change in quantity become a change in quality? And does that mean that the technological changes that we have been seeing for the past 10 years are structurally different uh, from the technological changes that we have been uh, seeing for the past two centuries? Uh, that's an open question uh, on which uh, researchers, uh, they like to fight all the time. And I don't think that uh, we have uh, an answer. I think it would be dangerous and naive uh, to simply say, as some do, not here at the European Commission, to be clear, certainly not myself, to basically do, well, we have always seen this change, so nothing, nothing to see, just move on and the markets will realign themselves. And the reason why that is dangerous is that, yes, I do believe, and I think that there are good numbers to show and good data to show that in the mid to long term, markets, in this case, labor markets, do find a way to realign themselves. But the question is, A, how long does it take? B, which other effects? does that realignment take? Economic change and labor market change historically have always been accompanied by political change. And I think the real question is not so much to object to this change. It's not like the European Commission or any government or anybody for that matter can wake up tomorrow and say, we don't want any more digitalization, full stop. There are some people who say that, but that is not going to happen. The question is, how do we steer those changes, uh, how do we manage those changes uh, so that uh, ideally we only take the good effects and not the bad effects, that's pretty difficult to do in practice, uh, but at least uh, we allow society at large and labor markets in this particular case uh, and workers, uh, you know, not to talk always in abstract, we're talking about human beings, about people, workers uh, 
current workers, future workers. Uh, to me, as I, I have two small children. Uh, to me, that's probably, but that's my personal, uh, where I'm coming from personally, it's even more important. It's not so much the workers of today, which have at least some degree of protection uh, in terms of in many, but not all European countries, uh, to deal with these changes is the future workers of tomorrow, which kind of labor markets will they have? Will we be able to build a, a, or to maintain a social protection system that is still fit for purpose for the changing nature of uh, labor, of digitalized uh, labor markets? You have mentioned earlier that we should be critical of numbers and that statistics should be taken with a grain of salt. And we understand what you mean by that. And at the same time, then an ideology should not be imposed on society top down and dictate how it should be. So I guess the desirable approach is to strike a fair balance between what is, between the facts and the direction we would like to go according to the values that Europe stands for. Recently, a working group has just delivered its report on the theme of the future of work. Can you talk a little bit about that group so that maybe you can show us with this example one of the ways in which the European Commission wishes to address this issue? Sure. Before I get to that uh, expert group uh, that uh, has indeed produced a report recently and that I have been uh, managing together with other colleagues, uh, just to be clear on uh, uh, ideology and numbers and data, uh, and I want to be entirely uh, open on this, uh, I do not object at all uh, in people having their own ideology, having their own political ideas. In fact, I think that a mistake uh, of the past uh, probably 20 years uh, in the field of labor discussions, but more generally in, in our societal discussion, has been to deny the existence of ideologies. You know, the idea was uh, 89 came, the Berlin Wall came down, Cold War is over, there are no more ideologies. And that was silly, because even assuming that those old ideologies or ways to look at the world uh, were completely over, which they're not, by the way, other ideologies <laughs> came up. Uh, and people always have uh, an idea, and it's good that they have an idea of what the world should look like. My point was more that we need to find a way to recognize uh, that we do have these different uh, ways to look at uh, at how the world should be and how it should look like in the future, that these different ways to look at the world now in the future have a deep impact on our discussions on labor markets, on the world of work, including on how digitalization will impact or how it should impact this world of work. And by and large, I have to say, let's not forget that in Europe, with all our defects and with all our bickerings and with all our discussions, we have by and large find a way to handle these very complicated discussions uh, without uh, uh, breaking each other's head open in democracy, in peace. And if you look at the history of humankind as a whole, that is not the natural way in which human beings uh, usually handle their different perspectives. Uh, the more natural way is to kill the one that has a different opinion than, than you have. So we should definitely not go there. But at the same time, uh, we should not simply forget that this ideology is a kiss. My point is, and it's, it's a process and it's very difficult and probably also make that mistake when I do my job here and maybe other colleagues uh, do as well. There is a fine line between looking at the numbers and trying to get the best numbers, the best data that you can, and then taking a decision or in my case, advising somebody else to take a decision knowing fully well that the way you look at the data and the advice that you give is colored by the particular ideology that you have. So that is one way to look at it. The other side, which I do think is dangerous, uh, is to start from your ideology and then uh, very willfully only looking at the data, at the numbers, uh, at those parts of reality which confirm your ideology, kind of a self-selection bias, if you will. And that is very, very common, and it's very natural. It's a very common human trait, and it takes a bit of, uh, more than a bit, it takes quite a bit of effort and discipline not to do it. So sorry for spending a bit of time on this, but I just wanted to be clear that I don't have anything against ideologies. Everybody has them, and it's a good thing that we have different ideologies. But when we look at the data, we should really strive to compartmentalize, if at all possible, uh, our ideologies uh, 
and be intellectually honest with ourselves when we look at that data. Now, one way in which uh, we can do that, uh, at least in the European Commission, is because we know perfectly well that as it happens in any organization, uh, and certainly in a political organization such as the European Commission, uh, the risk of uh, self-selection bias the risk of uh, which, you know, I, my colleagues at the European Commission are, by and large, uh, very competent people, uh, very well prepared. We all had to pass quite strict competitions to enter here. So it's not that we don't make mistakes for the record, but realistically, if you look at the average education level and the average uh, ability to look at the data, is pretty high compared to the average. And yet, so once you get into a particular environment, you naturally start uh, thinking uh, the group think danger is always there. And we know it. We, we realize it. I am myself quite a contrarian and my superiors appreciate that I'm a contrarian. But there are instances in which I realize that even being by, by nature a contrarian, I look at things from a particular angle because that's the angle which we have always used in the commission. So in order to cope with this very natural um, aspect of working in any organization, public or private, it doesn't matter. And that's true even in academia, that's true everywhere. In the commission, we often rely on so-called expert groups. There are different types of expert groups. I'm not going to bore you with all the bureaucratic details. Eh? But basically, expert groups uh, are uh, groups which we create, the European Commission creates, uh, of external people, professionals from different walks of life. Some expert groups formally represent member states' authorities. Some others are completely independent. People who participate in these expert groups in a completely independent fashion without taking instructions from their employers, their organization. And when we create such type of expert groups, the members of the expert group actually sign a paper stating, taking a quote-unquote oath, <laughs> saying that they will not, in providing their advice, they will not take instructions from anybody else. They will provide that advice on a very personal basis. Now, the expert group uh, that I have been uh, co-managing uh, or providing the secretariat of, if you will, uh, together with other colleagues, is called the High-Level Expert Group uh, on the Impact of the Digital Transformation on the EU Labour Markets. Very long name. I didn't decide it. But at the end of the day, this was an expert group uh, of uh, 10 members, uh, chaired by Professor Martin Hoss uh, of Utrecht University, which was tasked, it was created back in May 2018, if I remember correctly, through, by the way, a, a fully open selection procedure. So we published uh, what we call a call for expressions of interest. We received quite a large number of uh, candidatures, 80 plus, uh, if I remember. And then a selection committee, which I chaired, by the way, come to all the application letters and the CVs and the backgrounds, uh, the declaration of uh, absence of conflicts of interest and blah, blah, blah. And all these rules are all transparent or clear. I mean, nobody ever reads them eh, because it's they're very boring to be honest but I want to stress the point that the selection process to appoint members of an expert group eh, it's not that somebody in the commission whether myself or somebody else wakes up in the morning and says I want one, two, three, four because that could easily lead to situation of conflicts of interest there is a quite transparent process so you know the selection committee which I chair provides recommendation to the top management eh, of the parts of the commission which are responsible for the group eh, to cut a long story short this this group of 10 people, chaired by Professor Martin Hoss, was created back in May 2018. In practice, it couldn't meet before September because in the meantime, we had the summer break. The task of this expert group, the task that we gave to this expert group, was to advise the commission as well as other EU institutions, member states, to basically provide recommendations, bold, if I may say so, with new ideas on how to optimize how to make sure that the impact of digitalization on labor markets in Europe, this was really very much focused on EU labor markets uh, and on digitalization, uh, would produce good effects and how to minimize uh, the negative effects, uh, mostly I would say in the mid to long term. This group met for five times, they worked very hard, and again, to be clear, our job uh, in the commission, certainly my job, uh, was to provide the best possible support for this group. But in terms of substance, uh, the group was fiercely independent. It's not in our interest uh, to tell uh, a group of independent experts uh, to write what we want to hear. Because if we wanted to write what we want to hear, we would write it ourselves and it would be cheaper and more efficient uh, and you wouldn't have to go through all the hoops uh, of handling a group. No, when you create a group, when the commission creates an expert group, uh, we really want to hear ideas that for whatever reason are difficult to emerge. 
in uh, here in the commission uh, through the usual processes. So this group met for uh, uh, five times. All the minutes of the meetings are public. Uh, we, we try to maintain a very high degree of transparency on the workings of this expert group. Uh, and then it released uh, its final report with recommendations uh, on the 8th of April of this year, 2019. Uh, just the day before, by the way, of a very large uh, and politically very high level conference uh, on the future work which the Commission organized here in Brussels uh, with the participation of President Juncker and so on and so forth. Uh, now, I would encourage uh, people to read this report. Uh, perhaps I assume that when you publish your podcast, we, we could put a link to that report. Uh, mm-hmm. I and I, I'm very biased because I came to, you know, to very much appreciate both intellectually and personally the members of this group. Uh, it was not always an easy ride because there were different ideas around the table and the group did not have a lot of time uh, to deliver this recommendations, so choices also had to be made on what to focus and what not. Uh, I do believe that the report contains things that, uh, you know, yeah, nobody disagrees with. Uh, We need more skills and better skills and digital skills. uh, But on that point, for example, the report uh, does introduce a number, in my view, of interesting uh, questions such as, uh, okay, who should pay for the delivery of those skills? And uh, some say that the workers should pay on their own for the delivery of the skills. The workers in the union say, no way, why should we be responsible for that? Some others say that the private sector should do it, and the private sector, understandably, is not particularly keen on doing that. Also because in an era of high labor mobility, it's hardly in the interest uh, that a company does not have, have an incentive to upskill, quote unquote, a worker, knowing that that worker, as soon as he or she is upskilled, is going to move to another company. So that's an additional complication for companies. The report, for example, introduces the notion that maybe we could have uh, so-called labor market intermediaries, such as stamp agencies, uh, take at least part of the responsibility because, and it's explained more in depth in the report, uh, they actually have an economic incentive uh, to have uh, a more highly skilled uh, workforce uh, to, uh, quote unquote, allocate to the different uh, uh, companies which request it. This is just one example. There are other recommendations, nine in total. Uh, I think people should read it, uh, uh, criticize, read the report and the recommendations, uh, criticize them, uh, keep in mind that it is not the only report uh, out there. There are plenty of reports on the future of work. Sometimes I I wonder whether we even have too many, to be honest. Uh, And knowing, uh, and this is very important, uh, the recommendations of this high-level expert group uh, do not bind the European Commission. These are the opinions of the high-level expert group. The commission, I can tell you, and that's also what I'm doing uh, in these days, uh, is assessing those recommendations and trying to understand, okay, do they make sense from our perspective? And I think they do, but that's my opinion. If so, how do we actually turn them into practice? That's always the difficulty because I'm saying this as a very proud EU civil servant uh, and I have been a EU civil servant and a temporary diplomat for 12 years now. The difficulty is always that I think that on the discussions around uh, the future work generally, which is not only about digitalization, then within that about digitalization and the future work, actually I feel that there is a broad consensus uh, on what are the main issues and what is the respective weight uh, uh, of the different issues. And my sense, and as we were saying before, is that actually the issue of uh, automation, complete displacement of jobs by automation, uh, I think there is a consensus that it is po- probably a, an exaggerated issue. But as we said, there are other issues. So I feel there is consensus on what are the main questions. Uh, we are slowly getting to a point uh, in which we agree on what is the right or what are the right methods to find uh, answers to those questions. And when I say method, I'm not only referring to you know, scientific method, which is complicated in by itself. Which numbers do we use? Where do we find the statistical data? All of this is very important. Uh, I'm also talking about uh, what I'm referring to is how do we discuss this with our citizens? That's a very important part of the whole debate. Uh, there I feel that uh, we need, uh, we meaning collectively, we, everybody who is interested in these issues and has the means uh, to lead this discussion, uh, we should talk a lot more and a lot more openly with our citizens uh, because there would be bumps on the road. This is unavoidable. And uh, if you just tell citizens, uh, either, yeah, not worry, don't worry, everything will be fine. People are not stupid and they understand very well that that is not going to be the case. Uh, Or even worse, what has been the case in my view for the politics of the past uh, 15, 20 years, uh, the answer by and large has been, uh, uh, well, we can't do anything about it. 
is the economy baby, so just uh, accept it. Uh, and obviously, you know, I, I, I mean, it, it sounded obvious to me and it sounds obvious today, but um, clearly at the time it was not that obvious. If you tell a citizen and the voter that you as a senior decision maker in the private or public sector cannot do anything about X, why would that citizen give you the vote or give you trust? What is in it for that person? Clearly, that person will choose, uh, or most probably, that person will choose to give uh, his or her vote or trust or confidence, uh, whatever word you want to define, to other people who I don't think they have uh, had or have any better answers uh, to the issues that we're discussing today, digitalization, work, etc. But they have uh, easy answers. Like, let's kick out all the immigrants uh, and our labor markets will magically become productive. Let's build a wall. Let's do all this kind of stuff. Uh, and I don't think that you can entirely criticize people for being worried uh, about what's going to happen to their jobs uh, and to their working life uh, when uh, the debate, a constructive and rational debate uh, on that uh, has not been happening, is not happening uh, at the same time. Other people, other decision makers, politicians, uh, CEOs, whatever, enter into the fray and they provide these very sexy and attractive answers, which also happen to be wrong. Uh, I don't think you can criticize people that much for choosing those sexy, those sexy answers. You need to provide the alternative uh, political debate. So I think that we are getting to a point in which we are recognizing that this political debate has to happen. It is to some extent still happening. I would like to see it happening more at the, you know, in, in every day's people life. Uh, and that is not, it's not obvious how to do it. And probably the European Commission is not best placed to do that as an institution because we are sitting in Brussels and this is a debate that you need to have in the streets of, uh, of the small cities, of the factories. The European Commission cannot go everywhere and have uh, this discussion. Once we get to that point, uh, uh, then we can start to discuss, uh, okay, we agree on what are the problems, we agree on how to have the discussion about the problems, uh, and then starts the really difficult discussion, which is which solutions do we want to choose? I think there is a menu of policy options uh, out there, some regulatory, some non-regulatory, some about uh, you know using tax incentives. I, I could make a full list, and we are making a full list. Uh, but at the end of the day, they all remain very theoretical until you go through these other steps. And it's quite telling to me that if you look at the manifestos or programs or proposals uh, of most of the political parties or political families or political groups uh, which are running for the next uh, elections of the European Parliament uh, at the end of May, so it doesn't, uh, we're there basically, Actually, with very few exceptions, uh, whether it's called future work or not, but these issues that we're talking about, uh, in particular digitalization uh, and uh, changes in the labor markets, uh, are very central in all of the manifestos. That is a good thing. It means that the topic has become uh, politically important and politically relevant. I have my own personal preferences on what the solutions uh, should look like, but I don't mind. I'm happy that now we are truly discussing this, uh, at least in, in the context of the European Parliament election. And then you, know, you could argue that not all European citizens are that interested in the debates of the European Parliament elections, but it's a start. It's a basis of which to build. You have mentioned serving as a diplomat in the United States for a couple of years. May I ask what your role was there? So I served for four years, actually, in Washington, D.C., in the delegation of the European Union to the U.S., uh, which is basically the embassy of the European Union. But for legal reasons, we, we cannot define ourselves as an embassy because the European Union is not a state. But the functions of the delegation of the European Union is, by and large, similar to the functions of a national embassy. So I served there between 2014 and 2018. Uh, and my my title, if I remember it correctly, was a, a counselor or diplomatic counselor for the digital economy. And my dossier or portfolio was, as the name implies, a digital economy was a very large dossier because basically everything that had the term digital attached to it uh, tended to land on my desk. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, perhaps, well, fun to me, but two fun facts. Uh, one of the first things when I arrived in Washington and I was told that that would be my job title, which was not entirely clear to me. I, I knew what I would be doing, but the actual job title, it was not entirely clear to me. I remember the first thing I said is uh, my job title doesn't actually make sense. Uh, 
because how do you define the non-digital economy, especially in the US nowadays? I mean, you could argue the same for Europe, but especially in the US, uh, there is basically no sector of the US or of the European economy which is not uh, in large or in small part uh, completely driven by or uh, certainly influenced by digital technologies. So once again, if you can't define what something is not, uh, then it's very difficult to define what the thing is. So ultimately in practice, in the end, I, I tended to focus on uh, a wide range of topics uh, depending on the priorities of the day or of the month uh, during my tenure there in the US. Uh, one of the very big issues was certainly the reform of the European privacy and data protection rules, the so-called General Data Protection Regulation, which was uh, interestingly linked to what I do today, because one could argue that the way in which in certain, certainly certain sectors uh, in which data processing uh, has always been uh, the core business model uh, of companies. And I'm not only thinking about the Googles and the Facebook of this world. This is true in many of the advanced services uh, sectors. Uh, but more and more, even in more traditional uh, sectors, uh, the way in which personal data is collected, uh, analyzed, processed, and then used uh, has come to the forefront of labor discussions. Uh, Silly example, well, not silly, actually, a very important example, but uh, a, a common example is the way in which labor unions uh, are increasingly uh, questioning uh, or asking uh, more information, more transparency, more accountability on the way in which employers uh, collect workers' personal data, which is not a new phenomenon. I mean, if you look at traditional factory floors, it was always common to, at the very least, to time uh, the processes and to see how much a particular worker would take uh, to perform the task. Uh, but nowadays, we have a situation in which you can actually gather a lot more data about workers uh, without even the workers' knowledge or understanding. And what makes things even more complicated is that sometimes it's good for the worker to collect that data. Because if you can, for example, from uh, imagine that you provide every worker with a, a Fitbit or an equivalent uh, health bracelet to measure you know, the pulse uh, and all kind of the health data, you do that, uh, and then you realize that a worker in that particular task uh, is, uh, you know, pressure is increasing, and there are very good reasons to believe that that worker might have a heart attack in the next month or so, maybe because he, he has uh, or she has pre-existing conditions. Well, as an employer, then you say, okay, I don't want that worker to die of heart attack, uh, A, because one would hope I'm a decent human being, and B, because that's a mess in terms of insurance and everything, so I'm going to move that worker somewhere else. That is not bad for the worker. But of course, the question is, uh, does the worker know about that? And what happens when that personal data which is collected is used not for that, let's say, positive uh, reason, uh, but to discriminate against workers uh, or to put pressure on workers? Uh, my point here is that uh, uh, today, if I look back, I found it interesting that when I was in the US, uh, the whole, it was not the only thing that I followed, but the questions around uh, privacy and more generally data collection and data use, uh, which then linked interestingly to the debate on artificial intelligence because, you know, automated decisions are based on data, on the gathering of data. And then there is the question, how is this data collected and used uh, with which levels of transparency, etc. So I find it interesting today to look back uh, and to see that Actually, those debates on personal data were, to me, in the U.S., and the political importance that those debates had in the U.S. Uh, were already a signal uh, of uh, the way in which the use of data and the use of personal data would play an important role in the debates on uh, labor and the organization of the workplace that we are seeing today. Unfortunately, those two wars, and you know, I, I've had my feet in both wars uh, for, uh, for some time now, I feel that those two wars, so the world of people who deal a lot with, uh, um, you know, the ethics and rules uh, and the technological side of how you collect data and how you use data, and the world of uh, uh, labor, labor researchers, labor advocates, uh, from whichever side of the of the employer-employee separation, if you will, they don't talk to each other a lot. So that's an area where I think we can uh, we can do more and better. Your experience in the U.S. is important for me because I was going to ask you a question about Europe in the world. All these policies and reflections, the actions that Europe wants to put in place, I think should consider or at least cannot ignore what goes on in the rest of the world, especially very important arenas like the United States or other 
large influential countries with their markets. So how important is it for Europe to know where it stands compared to the rest of the world? And how does this influence the policies, maybe even your own work, in the light of the fact that Europe needs to keep a relation with these other places in the world with which we trade all the time? We trade goods and there is a flow of people coming in and out all the time. So how does Europe, with its values and its actions in the field of work, relate, connects finds a balance with the rest of the world, the big picture? Uh, that's a, a super interesting and also super complicated question, uh, but I will try to be brief and unpack what I think are the main uh, elements, at least for me. Um, but first of all, uh, as you said, uh, uh, or as you were suggesting, I think, uh, Europe is not alone in the world, and uh, it would be naive to think that we can take whichever choice we want to take without considering the positions uh, of our main trading partners, uh, uh, our main political uh, uh, allies in some cases, opponents uh, in other cases. Uh, so certainly the debates on labor markets in Europe cannot happen uh, purely looking at Europe. We need to look at those in a global context. To me, what is really important from that point of view is to look at the realities that the trade, international trade realities uh, of uh, complex economies, which means that there used to be the time where you could realistically think, uh, okay, I'm going to repatriate, whether in Europe uh, or in one single country within Europe, uh, all the different parts of the production process of a good or of a service. And this has a number of uh, short-term advantages. It certainly allows you to have more political control, including on how you want to manage labor markets. And to go back to the point on ideology that we were discussing before, there are some political forces out there which want that, which are arguing that that is indeed possible, mostly at the national level, not at the European level. I'll be honest, I think that's a complete fantasy, that if you look at the reality of a complex, uh, if it ever were true, but certainly if you look at the reality of complex production processes nowadays, the idea that you can repatriate everything uh, and therefore manage more directly and more independently your labor markets at the national level, I don't think it can ever be done, even at the European level. It's complicated because let's not forget that Europe uh, lacks uh, severely certain natural resources that are needed in almost all industrial sectors, including the digital sectors. Uh, think, for example, about so-called rare earth materials, uh, which are needed to build the devices that we're using today, computers, smartphones, etc., which are, uh, uh, for the time being, seem to be concentrated mostly in China and in Africa. So that's one angle. We need to look at the realities of complex trade relation, and that doesn't mean that we can or we should uh, when we engage in trade negotiations with other countries, I don't think at all, nor it is the position of the European Commission, uh, that we should uh, compete uh, on labor cost. That would be a mistake. We should also, and that's a point that is pushed very hard by the labor unions uh, and on personal point of view, I think they're completely right, uh, that there should be no trade agreement with a third country unless we manage to impose uh, labor conditions uh, in that third country, which are, if not equivalent, at least comparable to labor conditions in our continent in Europe. Otherwise, we are basically putting our own labor force uh, at a competitive disadvantage uh, with third countries where labor standards are nowhere as protective as they are in Europe. So that's one way to look at the international dimension. The other way in which I choose to look at it uh, is that, and I say this with uh, uh, a lot of admiration and respect for the United States of America, where you know I live for four years, it's a country that for both professional and personal reasons, I came to like intensely. And I think there are more than a few things which we Europeans could learn from the Americans, in particular their can-do attitude, their pragmatic attitude. There is an issue, you know, the, the joke is always that when there is a problem, the American will look at the problem and the first thing uh, the American will think is how do I fix the problem? The European looks at the same problem and the first thing that the European thinks is uh, who do I blame for that problem? Now, this is a bit exaggerated, but there is, I, I touch for sand, there is a certain degree of truth in this. So, a lot of respect for the United States of America, also a lot of respect for China. And I think that people here in Europe really are very ignorant about China and that they underestimate the incredible history 
that that country has. Uh, and the way that China looks at itself and the rest of the world is also a result of the millennial history that it has. And I, I think we make a mistake by looking at China as a, a communist country to which we have to convey values. And uh, if anything, the Chinese don't care for that and they will not accept that kind of relationship. But having said all of this, I really feel that sometimes in Europe uh, we we spend our time in uh, auto da fe to think about medieval times uh, and to complain how how behind we are, uh, how much we're losing the race on X, Y, or Z, and put whatever kind of technology you want on X, Y, or Z. I think that sometimes we have to be a little bit more uh, objective and realistic. I think that, one, Europe uh, still has, uh, on average, uh, and in macroeconomic terms, is the average that counts. It's not the stars of the system, is the average. On average, we still have a very healthy population, uh, a very well-educated population, a very innovative economy. Labor markets, which are, uh, uh, you will get different uh, answers depending on who you ask. But if you look at the numbers, uh, you have labor markets, which are fairly flexible and still uh, quite protective with some worrying uh, holes uh, of protection for so-called new forms of work. And that's something that we should address in the proper in the proper way. So. The world uh, in Europe, or you know, Europe is not as bad uh, as people sometimes think. And I think that the main risk is that we berate ourselves that much uh, that we try to mimic other parts of the world uh, um, because they, I don't know, they are winning the race on artificial intelligence, or they are doing this, or they are doing that. Uh, and by doing that, uh, we forget that through the so-called European social model, we have managed to ensure, not the only way, but one of the ways in which we have managed to ensure uh, by now 59, you know, more than 70 years of peace in a continent that for the past uh, centuries has known nothing but war. And this is not about being rhetorical, but it's about recognizing that in managing our labor markets, in managing our social protection system, in doing all of these things, and in dealing with the impact of digitalization, we must have done something right. Because we have managed to maintain a degree of social peace uh, and not without issues and problems. We had our terrorism, we had domestic terrorism, we had our own social conflict, we had the, we were in the middle of the Cold War, uh, you know, we had a wall running in our people like to think about walls in other parts of the world. We had a wall running in our continent. Uh, we managed to handle that. And, you know, if I may, I remember that on, I think it was the last event that I spoke at while I was in the U.S. And because it was my last event, I was going back to Brussels. I decided to be slightly less diplomatic than I usually was because I thought, who cares? This is a problem for my success or not for me. And it was actually an event exactly about uh, um, skills and labor markets and the uh, dynamism of the economy. And it was in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, actually. And one of the, I think it was one of the other panelists that made a point, which is the typical point that is always made in these cases, which is, uh, well, Europe has a problem because look at the number of unicorns uh, that you have in the U.S. For those who don't know the jargon, a unicorn is a private company which is valued at $1 billion or more. So it turns out that uh, the U.S. at that point in time had like 13 unicorns, uh, Uber plus a few others. Uh, China had, I don't know, five or six unicorns. Uh, and Europe had... Uh, uh, depending on how you count it, uh, zero or one unicorn. And I remember answering to that question, to that point, uh, saying, uh, who cares? Why would, you, why would you judge the performance uh, of a society, of a country, or of a, whatever you want to call it, of a union of countries such as the European Union, on the basis of number of unicorns that you have? To me, the metrics that are worth is, if you want to be a bit arithmetic about it, uh, is what is the average wage? in the country. Uh, what is the so-called wage polarization? Uh, so, you know, the difference between the lowest wage and the highest wage. And it turns out that uh, time and again, uh, when that polarization, when that difference increases too much, then you have social tension. What is the, uh, the level, the quality of public services? What is the average age expectancy at birth uh, and uh, in old age? You know, these are the kinds of questions that I personally think we need to answer. If it turns out that having uh, 100 unicorns, so private companies valued at 1 billion uh, euros or dollars or more, 
produces all of these good effects, uh, good and fair labor markets, uh, uh, possibility for people not only to have decent work, but also to excel if they want to, fair enough. I will all be for creating uh, unicorns everywhere. But if it turns out that it either has nothing to do, so having unicorns has nothing to do, or, and the question is open there, to be fair, I don't claim to have the straight answer, but, you know, there are numbers suggesting that in order to produce the economic environment uh, which tends to create uh, unicorns, uh, these superstar companies, uh, then there is something that you have to sacrifice. Uh, and usually that's something that you have to sacrifice uh, is the kind of uh, social security network of protection, uh, which in Europe we came to appreciate uh, very much. So I guess the bottom line is Europe has issues uh, in terms of uh, uh, levels of employment, especially youngsters' employment. Uh, I think we need to, uh, as the Americans would say, wake up and smell the coffee more quickly than we have been uh, doing until now on what is how to handle digitalization without running around like Chicken Little that the sky is falling, but also without thinking, yeah, doesn't matter, it will fix it by itself. I, it won't. We need to have an active intervention. So we need to have that debate. So realizing all of these issues, if you will, but also not forgetting that we are a continent uh, which can claim quite a few successes uh, by and large, uh, not only in terms of technological progress, and we have successes there as well, but more importantly to me, in the way in which technology has been used for the public good, for the, for the greater good. Thank you very much, Andrea, for your time and for sharing with us your experience in this field and showing us how one can have a truly intelligent, fair and constructive discussion around these complex themes that are close to the heart of the European Commission. And I'm glad that we got a chance to expose a bit of the behind the scenes work, if you will, because indeed it does not always translate quickly nor evidently in the lives of all of us. But the fact that it is there is a demonstration of a strong sense of civilization. So I'm very glad we got to talk about that. And the reason why I could invite you on the podcast today is that I had the chance to meet you last year. So I would like to thank the organizers of the EU-US Young Leaders Seminar, the teams of the Fulbright Erasmus Plus and Maris Klodowska QD programs. Thank you very much to them and thank you very much, Andrea, for being on Technoculture. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, the opportunity and uh, also the questions, sir which were, uh, I must say, much more intelligent questions than the one that they're usually asked uh, when talking about the future of work. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast. 